Thanks for 100k, by the way. You ever play a game so good you just can't stop yourself from sheepishly weeping behind the monitor? Not something that's designed to, like a To The Moon or a What Remains of Edith Finch, just a game that's so fun from start to finish and so full of soul it can't help but reduce you to tears come the end of its runtime. I want to talk about the game that did that to me today, which is of course, Timefall 2. I wasn't expecting Anohana to get trumped in the bittersweet tears department by a robot giving me a thumbs up, but I'm not ashamed to admit that that's the case. Anyway, servers only work like 30% of the time and it's published by EA. Get it on sale. Moving on. To me, the single player FPS has always been a bit hit or miss, miss, miss. All right, you get what I'm going for here. I grew up at a time when multiplayer FPS was starting to really take off on home consoles and the single player started to embrace a more cinematic approach to storytelling that ultimately left me landing on someone else's years of hard work with a feeling of it's fine. I didn't exactly gel with games focused around strong set pieces, and I got a lot more out of the titles released a little before my time that focused on their core gameplay, but even with those I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't all that engaged. Doom, Quake, and anything made in this engine are games that trend towards my side of the preferential fence, but I'm not enamoured with them. That's probably why when the boomer shooter started to gain some traction, there were a lot of games that got added to my wishlist, but they're gonna stay there until the earth cooks over, which at the current rate, sometime next week. I certainly don't want any of these games to stop. Smaller teams developing games that they love irrespective of mainstream appeal is a big thumbs up in my book, but as someone who wasn't raised on many of the titles that they take inspiration from, I'm likely going to pass up on most of them. That's probably why when I got finished with Dusk along with the new Dooms and felt fat with the feeling of getting my boomer shooter fill, I passed up on Ultra Kill in service of whatever the fuck's going on here. Little did I know that I'd let my misconceptions of what exactly this game is put me off of what might end up becoming the single greatest first person shooter of all time. And I say that with very little hyperbole. Even better than Doom Eternal, I hear you say in a tone that implies your social skills are still as threadbare as the day you stumbled out of the womb. I mean, all I did was ask a question. Yes, by a landslide. Doom Eternal is all style and a decent amount of substance, like an overly expensive restaurant, but Ultra Kill is all style, all substance. Then once the meal's done, it comes out of the kitchen to kiss you on the forehead and offers you a handy under the table, but it won't be offended if you reject it. Not enough of you have had that experience. And to put it bluntly, turning down any handy is an insult to the chef in my books. So instead of doing what YouTube wants me to do by begging at your feet for bells like it's some kind of Tory occupation Animal Crossing, how about I grovel until you play a game that I like? That way I can stop trying to subliminally advertise it to you and I can get you to do what I want a lot faster. Speaking of, here's a bar graph, don't think about it too hard. Keep in mind, this is still under development, making this half recommendation, half analysis of the video at risk of becoming a fragrant lie in a couple of months time. But with development so particular, whilst also having every new patch push my firstborn further and further away from the happiest day of my life, I've got confidence in saying that it's only going to get better from here. I mean, it's not like there's ever been a game where a whole third of it is completely unenjoyable, frustrating, and almost entirely incohesive with everything that's come before it. B. On first glance, Ultra Kill might seem like a very speedy, stylish, but ultimately simple FPS. Parrying and charge shots are neat, yet they probably don't have that much place once you're deeper into the game. The guns are a little archetypal, and the enemies are straightforward. But there's a charm to the presentation. You feel like you're moving a million miles an hour, without coming across as unwieldy. Every shot fired and hit taken has a real force to it, all laid against a soundtrack that sounds very much unlike anything you'd expect, but still has an infectious kick to it that matches the game's ferocious pace. In the first hour especially, this presentation was the delicious icing bow on a cake that I wasn't all that interested in. However, as time went on, this audio and visual treat started to unwrap itself, revealing a game with an endless stream of tricks up its sleeve, taking its seemingly limited pool of mechanics and constantly reframing them in interesting and unexpected ways. Once you get past the first major boss, and maybe before that if you're not a fucking idiot, you'll realize that your first glance was ignorant. It's still speedy, and it's still stylized, but there's a mountain of new ideas here that makes the title ooze with charisma and depth that will have you struggling to pull yourself away. 
that might seem like a bit of a reach. It's PSX inspired visuals in a first person shooter, the point and click adventure with extra steps that all the racists, Russians, and racist Russians flock to. If you want to be a cynic, then maybe it would be more accurate to call them twists on a formula. Maybe the ideas aren't new. But Ultra Kill is still pushing the bounds on what you can do inside of that point and click. Take for example the Marksman, more specifically the coin that it spawns. Initially this coin seems like a fun gimmick, and it is. It feels great to sling the coin towards an enemy and rebound your shot to them, especially when it creates an unexpected string of chaos. However, there's two extra elements that makes this satisfying and versatile 100 hours deep. The sing and momentum. One element adds an extra layer of challenge by asking you to time your shot so that you can get two ricochets instead of one, and the other makes every coin seem a little unique while also being consistent enough to not be unpredictable. What starts out as occasionally hitting the sing by accident eventually becomes a refinement that you start to understand. Some of that chaos from before starts to become a little more consistent as you start to get a feel for when's best to bite the trigger, and you start to change how you use the coins as a result. You stop throwing them out with as much haste and start to pay more attention to your throw. That's probably when you'll start to notice how momentum works into the coin, and gradually this object that felt like a fun gimmick starts to feel powerful in a way that it wasn't before, even though you're not really sure what's changed. It stops being this gamey resource on a timer. When it leaves your hand, it becomes an object of the world, which makes just the act of right-clicking to make an object spawn this elaborate on-the-fly execution of speed, angles, and distance. Eventually, you're bending bullets round corners and taking out two guys at once with a well-positioned coin and expertly timed shot, and that unexpected chaos from before becomes consistent and far more satisfying than when it was seemingly random circumstance. What starts out as feeling strong through the game's presentation transforms into being strong through your ability to perform a task. And that feels fucking awesome. You can find some of this player-game relation- I don't know what you'd call it- in most first-person shooters through the headshot, but with that you're being asked if you can just do a task. There's a somewhat low ceiling on how satisfying that can be because the task just isn't that complex. That's why at the start of a game or play session, you notice every well-aimed shot, but not even a couple of minutes deep, that becomes just another portion of interactive white noise. Ultra Kill, on the other hand, isn't just rewarding if you can do the task, but also how you do it. After sings and perfectly positioned coins become standardized and you stop feeling that reward, you're at the point where you're unwrapping the layers of application that becomes this new kind of reward, all resulting in a weapon that had me ignore everything else on my first playthrough, right up until me- Oh fuck, that's a spoiler. Don't worry, you'll get it when you're older. The real power of this, to me, is that all of this potential stops Ultra Kill from just being a reactive game. If you want to engage with this game very passively and treat it like an exceptionally fast Quake or Dusk, then you can. But one of the strengths that separates this game from its contemporaries is how many chains of active decisions there are in any combat scenario. And this isn't just limited to the coin. Every weapon has a chain of choices that elaborates your relationship with your weapons, the enemies, and the space around you. If we were to just look at the coin to not overcomplicate things, you can see this kind of spread of choices in any given situation. We can throw a coin right in front of us and just try and thin the crowd take really easy direct shots over the ones that are hard to miss, using the coin to hit the street sweeper's weak spot and then get everything out instantly, using the coin to hit the core eject that- wait, hold, hold on a minute, core eject? That's in a different weapon. What's the- let me just peel this back a little bit and- Oh, how could I have forgotten? Something that I've been intentionally dancing around is the fact that there is a well of choices to make in this game. And for as much as I want to talk about the specifics of that well, I also don't want to ruin any more of what there is to mechanically explore inside of it. I'm here to convince you to play Ultra Kill, and I'll watch a video about it. What I want to get at is that the Marksman, while definitely the most expensive weapon at the moment, is a victim of incredible interweaving between systems. A horrible crime, I'm sure you'd agree, that's being committed all over the game. When we isolate just one weapon or mechanic, there's a larger list of potential, but not required, choices than most games, which is already pretty engaging by itself. However, when we stop focusing on just one element of gameplay and zoom out to see how it connects to the rest of the player's arsenal, we can start to see all of the different elements that it feeds into, that doesn't create chains, but webs of choices. And I just want to point out quickly, the value of that isn't that you have a lot of choices to make. Not to punch down at 
multi-million dollar IPs, but the modern military shooters that dominated the late 2000s and mid-2010s technically had a lot of choices. There were loads of different tools to choose from for any particular job, thing is out of those 20-something tools, many of them filled the same role. The M4s and the AKs, or whatever they were called in COD 4, they were technically different, but they were functionally indistinguishable. Outside of their effective range, they didn't really alter how you approached the enemy, and regardless of what you were holding, the things that you could do with the tool were one-dimensional. You shoot the man, mm. That's not to say that any of these games were bad, but it meant that if the game wanted to keep your attention, it had to be the one to dictate the pace through the environment in set pieces. The game doesn't play itself, but there's less room for you to play the game. Conversely, in Ultra Kill, you still have a lot of tools to choose from, however, thanks to the way that each choice is connected and those connections are made meaningful, you're constantly evolving your relationship with the elements of play you have control of. Combine that with a healing system that makes staying healthy your responsibility, and Ultra Kill becomes extremely player-driven, where you dictate the pace of almost every scenario. And while that's not necessarily unique, Ultra Kill is uniquely good at it. You know, it really frustrates me that one of the most viewed videos about this game is called Doom Eternal on a Budget, because not only does that imply that this game is like Doom, which... Uh, to TLDR it, it's not, but also because if we're really going to call over to another game, it would probably be more accurate to call it the game Bulletstorm should have been, or like Vanquish, if it was actually good. Both of these games set out to make incredibly player-driven experiences, and mechanically they succeed. Bulletstorm especially has these unique weapons that all function completely differently from one another that makes completing its encyclopedia of challenges intensely gratifying. And Vanquish has speed and flair, with hints of the chaining that Ultra Kill would eventually find. Each of these games is excellent on paper, yet they manage to handicap themselves in their own unique ways. Bulletstorm limits itself to three guns with regenerating health that gives the entire game this start-stop pace that doesn't complement the rest of the mechanics or environment that are begging to be blitzed through. It was also cursed to have fucking Gears Syndrome. I don't care, let me go to the next bit! Vanquish has environments that are uninspired straight lines, supplemented by a resource system that limits the player's creativity, turning most fights into one-dimensional spray sessions propped up by slow motion. Also, more Gears Syndrome. Although this one kind of knows it. More like getting good and looking like an asshole. The problem with these games, and what I think a lot of player-driven FPS games struggle with, is that they don't develop the structure to support the gameplay that they've created. Ultra Kill could have walked into the same trap, yet it never makes the fumble many games before it has. Even though the cyber grind, the endless wave mode of this game, shows that even a box with random enemies can be fantastic, the campaign is constantly pulling apart the random Lego bricks that Ultra Kill is built on, reforming them to make new and exciting scenarios. Maybe not the kind of excitement brought about by a big robot dinosaur, that's actually a bit shit, more subtle changes to things along the lines of area layouts and enemy placement. The stuff that won't grab your attention, but ends up being the secret to what makes a level fun. You ever find it weird how in like a lot of FPS games, you always walk into the threat, but the threat's also coming at you from the exact opposite direction? It means you're always going to approach the enemies from the same angle every time as you get funneled towards an exit. It creates this kind of predictable flow to a room. This isn't inherently a problem, but it does start to become an issue when it's a constant in your level design. It becomes especially troublesome in games which do give players the opportunity to handle non-linear situations, but then never create that scenario. Ultra Kill, on the other hand, doesn't really have a rule on how a room will flow. In the first stage you have a more conventional approach on how it spawns in enemies, just to get you familiar with the ropes, but pretty quickly the game starts to focus more on ambushes, throwing you in the centre of a scenario that forces you to make some kind of decision instantly. What's great about this is that you can still be ready, and the game can imply that something is coming, but you can't be prepared in the same way. It gives you less time to take in the space around you, with a murkier picture of what enemies are where, which makes you have to think on your feet more. When you're thrown into a corridor of enemies, and still given time to figure out the situation, a game's asking you, what's the right thing to do? It wants you to find its solution. When you're plopped in the centre of a collection of enemies with your pants down, you're being asked, what are you going to do? There might still be an intended answer, but you don't have time to find it. 
And so what you end up with is a solution that's your own. Maybe it's messy, or maybe it's clean, but whatever it is, it's yours, and each small victory feels more gratifying as a result. It doesn't just get rid of conventional room flow, though. It's not always an ambush. There's a part where you can see the entire area, but all the spawns are staggered. Every once in a while, enemies are positioned to create a sense of misdirection. Occasionally, you'll walk all the way to the end of a room, and then everyone pops out from behind you. It just knows how to keep rooms flowing in fresh ways. And sometimes it's not even a room. There's so much experimentation in the levels that I really don't want to spoil. But, like, verticality. When was the last time you looked up? Tell me. Fuck you. Take a whole tower. I get that a lot of this might seem plain. Trivial, even. In a game where I can solo an entire boss by punching a coin, who cares about arena design? But it's the combination of off-the-wall concepts with simple stuff like this that makes Ultra Kill feel like a classic you've never heard of before. It's refined like a game in 2022 should be, but it throws caution to the wind like it's 1995. I'd imagine this game takes a little inspiration from older FPS games with its Devil May Quake tagline, yet it really seems like it just doesn't care for what's ever been considered the right or wrong way to build an FPS. Ultra Kill's doing the things it's doing because it's cool. Who gives a shit if it's not what you're supposed to do? I can parry my own shotgun to make it explode and you're gonna fucking love it. And, and I do! Is it the best FPS ever made? Well, it's not wise to set the bar of your expectations so high, and I don't think it's fair to put all that pressure on a dev team that hasn't even finished the thing yet. But if you were to try and put a gun to my head and demand an answer, I would have already stopped you by talking your ear off about some shit I did in the cyber grind last night. I love this game. It's extremely rare for a game to hold my attention to its ending, let alone turn a game that you can finish in just about two hours into 125. I don't know if I've sold it to you, and in the interest of not spoiling what there is to offer, I've had to bite my tongue on so many of the things that I love. But if I can get this excited over a game that I didn't even really want to play that much, I do think that's the grounds to say that there's something special here. There's a demo on Steam, I'm pretty sure at this point it's really mechanically out of date, but I want you to at least consider giving it a shot. This game probably won't be for everyone, but I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you weren't to at least try it. I love this game, and for as much as this video probably hasn't explained why, I think you will too.